it's worth addressing that um, after so many debunked Israeli claims, the dozens of beheaded babies, the baby burned in an oven, uh, the baby cut out of a woman's fetus, um, or sorry, the 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 fetus cut out of the womb. Um, now Israel and its supporters are really doubling down on these claims of mass rape by militants on October seventh, and we pointed out a lot of the inconsistencies in those stories, but it persists, and the Biden administration has really tried to push it as well. Um, they've made a thing out of it. Hillary Clinton came out and made a thing out of it. CNN. Jake Tapper has tried to make a thing out of it. And now the New York Times has come out with a new story that people who buy into Israeli claims are really promoting um, that <coughs> making the claim that Hamas used sexual violence um, as a uh, tool of war, that there, there was a deliberate effort to use sexual violence as a tool of war on October 7th. But once again, people are overlooking the countervailing evidence and the inconsistencies even inside this own story, including the very quiet acknowledgement. And this is what the, a lot of the story is about. It's basically an elaborate effort to justify the fact that there's no physical evidence. Yeah. And also no testimony still. Um, yeah. So that's what the story basically is. Screams without words. Um, I mean, that's a quote from a oh, I, uh, an eyewitness who actually wasn't an eyewitness. Um, but it's kind of like we don't have the words. So we're just going to hear the screams anyway by by generating enough innuendo to make you believe that this actually took place. And you really have to harbor a lot of uh, academics would call it orientalist anti-Arab racism to believe that all this was true. You, I mean, this really this this narrative. It's like the Central Park Five for pantsuit feminists and pussy hat liberals who think that Arab men are just like these savages who could actually storm into another country or a storm through some, uh, you know, some border in a military operation and just stop in the middle of an intense confrontation with a powerful military and stand in a circle around a woman and start gang raping her and cutting her breasts off and playing with them because those are the testimonies contained in this article. But as you said, Aaron, the article by Jeffrey Gettleman, who is just like notorious for these kinds of pieces about Africa and other places, uh, it blames the lack of forensic evidence, the complete absence of any forensic evidence on Jewish burial rituals. Basically, the Jews bury their dead too quickly in 24 hours. So we just couldn't get at any of these bodies. So we're just going to go off of all these weird testimonies from dubious individuals who were supplied to Jeffrey Gettleman and Anat Schwartz and Adam Sella by the Israeli government. Because this is not Me Too. Me Too was like a fairly organic thing. Maybe there'd be a group of like three or five women who would get together in a workplace to accuse the boss. But this is a statewide conspiracy to justify a genocidal assault on an occupied people as international support falters. And it happened two months. It really cohered two months after the assault began. So I don't know. Do you want to go through some of the key claims here? Or how should we do this? Well, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, All right. Well, um, it's, it starts out with the woman in the black dress. In the grainy video, you can see her lying on her back, dress torn, legs spread, vagina exposed. I mean, they always they, they just throw that in there and it immediately does something to your mind to make you think that she must have been raped. And they don't show you the photo. But the photo, it's a woman who is searching for a missing friend at the site of the rape. It was shot by someone who was searching for a friend. And the video went viral and it depicts Gal Abdush, uh, who is attending the Nova Electronic Music Festival. And you know, they they use the term as the terrorists closed in on her. So they're they're using Israeli language. Um she sent one final message. You don't understand. Okay. 
and the, the New York Times verified the video evidence based largely on the video and verified by the New York Times. So, so what? So the video of her was real. Like no one can test that. So your verification is irrelevant, but they're trying to say we verified she was raped. They're trying to suggest that, but they never yeah. verified anything. The Israeli police said she be they believe she was the Israeli police is a highly politicized institution, deeply ingrained in the Israeli military. And the Israeli police was engaged in confrontations with Hamas gunmen on October 7th. Um, and look at their, how professional they are. They're so professional that they made a forensic examination and said they believe someone was raped based on video alone, grainy video. That's all it took for them. Yeah. So they have no credibility. And then they go on to, to basically do this long explanation for why there's no forensic evidence. Yeah. And one of the explanations comes from this group, Zaka, which, as you've reported at the Gray Zone, are frauds. They've They're been frauds. caught lying multiple times. And they yeah, even they have even, a, have they a even sexual Yossi Lando. They cite Yossi Lando, the guy who made yeah. up the, who confirmed the beheaded baby story and cooked up the uh, fetus cut out of the woman that never happened. But back to this woman, Abdush. I mean, I wrote about this in my piece on October 7th and Friendly Fire. If you actually look at the video, her car has been destroyed. She has burns like from an explosion on her head and her body has rigor mortis, which is why her legs are spread. It's a very typical posture for someone who has rigor mortis to be in and she fell out of her car because of the explosion so she may have been killed by hamas gunmen we're not di disputing that possibility they did have rpgs they were shooting at people who were fleeing the electronic music festival she also may have been killed by a hellfire missile her husband was killed separately and was burned to a crisp which suggests he was killed by an israeli apache helicopter uh, but there's no there, there's no proof of rape here and that that's like the key story that they have at the top then we, we move down okay then we got all these cars that i mean these are roasted cars a lot of them could have been there are israeli tanks and apache helicopters operating in the area we don't know what happened um okay the israeli we'll go through the whole thing the times viewed a video provided by the Israeli media, showing two dead Israeli soldiers at a base near Gaza who appeared to have been shot directly in their vaginas. That is not proof of anything. They may have been shot in other parts of their bodies, but uh, Israeli soldiers were shot on base. These were active duty soldiers in uniform who were enforcing the siege of the open air prison of Gaza. And many of them were women. The Israeli military puts women on base because that's their policy of full conscription. That doesn't prove that there was a policy of sexually targeting or gender-based violence. It proves there was a policy of attacking soldiers. Yep. They, yeah. And there's a line in there about uh, someone had nails driven into their groin. Uh, yeah. There's one line in there about that. There's no more details provided. Um, and that could be evidence of a really brutal crime, a really sadistic one. But yeah. it's not rape. And we need a actual details to be able to form a conclusion, including an independent investigation and at minimum forensic evidence, which there is none, which basically this article goes to great lengths to justify the fact that there is none. Uh, they talk about the chaos of the aftermath of October 7th and Jewish tradition says you have to bury the dead quickly yeah, um, yeah. and that some evidence was accidentally destroyed. It's basically a one long like, oops, we actually, oops, we didn't mean to. Uh, destroy the evidence, but we did. Oh, well. They were not focused on collecting semen samples from women's bodies, requesting autopsies, or closely examining crime scenes. At that moment, the authorities said they were intent on repelling Hamas and identifying the dead. Well, maybe there were no semen samples on women's bodies. Like, why is Jeffrey Gettleman presuming that that was there? Like, oh, well, there's all this semen all over the place, but we're just going to throw the bodies away because we have to bury them. Like, do you really think that that would have taken place? I'm sorry to laugh, but it's so ridiculous. I mean, if if rape happened, then obviously uh, the, it would be paramount to collect forensic evidence. And Hamas was repelled w w within what twenty four hours, like on October eighth well, and last, 9th. Yeah, was Hamas. So yeah. on October eighth, you could have taken all these samples, uh, and they're just trying to come up. I'm sorry to laugh.
because it's not funny, but it's but the logic here it's so it's so transparently ridiculous that it's comical. It is, and they're going to great lengths to put forward a case that is not supported by by any, by any evidence here. And why are they doing this? Because they need some kind of talking point to justify their barbarism in Gaza right now. That's what all this is is in the service of. They have not put a number on how many women were raped, saying that most are dead and buried and they will never know. No survivors have spoken publicly. And they say they've identified some supposed survivor in a mental hospital, but they won't furnish her. For the first you. time, this is the <laughs> first time that I've seen, and if anybody has other evidence to the contrary, I'll correct myself, but this is the first time I've seen anyone claim that there actually are survivors of sexual assault on October 7th. Before that, it was always ambiguous. Like, we don't know if there are survivors or not. So far, we we haven't identified any, but there could be. Now, all of a sudden, the New York Times has magically uncovered four people, it says, but uh, it says survive sexual assault. But as you said, Max, none of them are willing to talk, not to not to police, not to the media. So why and even so mention it? I mean, I, I wouldn't do that if I just heard from a criminally mendacious government that some may exist somewhere in a... Yeah. Uh, a mental health center, uh, but I can't talk to them. That wouldn't ri like ed from an editorial standpoint, that wouldn't rise to the level of evidence. Yeah. And this um, is journalistic malpractice. This is, this is the, the worst journalism at this discredited newspaper of record. And we're just going to keep ripping yeah. this piece to shreds. Um, oh, here, <laughs> A combination of chaos, enormous grief, and Jewish religious duties meant that many bodies were buried as quickly as possible. So if you question why they don't have any forensic evidence, you're anti-Semitic. Exactly. You're questioning yeah. Jewish religious duties. Yes. yes. And mo and then and the next line, most were never examined. Um, so you want us to accept all these claims while also acknowledging that most of the corpses were never even examined. And then it says uh, 360 people were slaughtered in a few hours. The bodies were hauled away by the truckload. Okay, you are a dupe. I mean, you don't even, it just shows how superficial the Jeffrey Gettleman's understanding of what happened on and after October 7th was because the bodies that were hauled away by the truckload were those of people from Gaza, including Hamas militants who had been killed by apache helicopters and is they they did not throw truckloads of jewish corpses together and just haul them away they were individually taken away in body bags uh by groups like zaka so that 360 num number also includes people from gaza who were killed inside israel on october 7th Okay, so they're at a loss to fully explain what happened to their loved ones in the final moment. In their yeah, final moments, you, but we're going to just give you a yeah. bunch of innuendo anyway. And why would you be at a loss to fully explain what happened? Uh, if you're sure that Hamas killed these people and even raped some of them, which is what you're telling us now, then why are you at a loss to explain it to the families? Uh, if you can explain it to us, why can't you explain it to the families? Because they're coming up with a story. And I think what that line indicates is actually not only... Do they don't have evidence of sexual assault, but actually they don't want to tell the families that Israel killed some of those people, some of those Israelis who died. That's why they're at a loss to explain it. Yeah, we're at a loss to explain what happened to, um, what's her name? Miss Abdush, because she may have been killed by a Hellfire missile. She was, her car was destroyed. She was badly burned. And she had rigor mortis. And we're just going to say she was, we're just going to tell you she was raped because she was dressed uh, in scantily clad because that's how people dress at raves uh, in the desert where it's hot and you're dancing all night. But we're just going to tell you that Hamas militants ripped their clothes off, even though we have no evidence whatsoever. Okay. Now they have like some testimony from someone named Sapir, who is a 24 year old accountant who has become one of Israeli police's key witnesses. Okay, so this is one of the key witnesses here. 
but we don't know who they are. We can't check their identity. They can't be questioned by other media. She doesn't want to be fully identified because she'll, she says she'll be hounded for the rest of her life if her last name were revealed. This is absurd testimony. Uh, and it's, and I will discredit it easily. Um, so she attended the rave. She was hiding. She said she was shot in the back. So she was faint. Um, so after she was shot in the back and hiding, we, we can't examine her injury, by the way, or even know for sure that she was shot in the back. But all of this testimony comes based on her recollection after being shot in the back. She saw motorcycles and trucks and about 100 men, uh, dark sweatsuits, and they get in and they congregate along the road with assault rifles, grenades, and and they congregate around badly wounded woman, women. It was like an assembly point. And she saw a young woman with copper colored hair, her pants pushed down to her knees and a man made her bend over and they started to rape her. And every time she flinched, they plunged a knife into her back. Okay. This is in the middle of an intense situation where they're the Hamas militants are supposed to collect as many captives as they can and get back into Gaza as quickly as possible. They have instructions to do this. This is a, a political imperative. And they achieved that goal largely while Israeli forces were in mobilizing to advance. Uh, but in the middle of all this, they had time to do this, shred a woman into pieces. Well, one terrorist raped her. They don't say Hamas militants, they say terrorist. Well, one terrorist raped her. Another pulled out a box cutter and sliced off her breast. And according to Sapir, one continues to rape her and the other throws her breast to someone else and they play with it, throw it, and it falls on the road. So they're playing with body parts. It's so obvious. I mean, does anyone believe this? Does anybody, does the New York Times reporter who wrote this article really believe that? that they're, pl they're passing it around like. Uh, yeah. And, and if so, did they ever recover this? I'm sorry to be so graphic. They're just such savages. They're just, yeah. they're just so crazy that they. Did anybody they ever. Time, did anybody yeah. ever recover this body part that was sliced off and played with, and so therefore has the DNA of the of these savage terrorists that were doing that? It's so obvious what's going on here. I'm not afraid to call it out. They're playing on these ridiculous and insane racist stereotypes of savage Muslim men coming up with the most ridiculous stories, and they rightfully expect a liberal, educated New York Times audience to believe this. Um, and the New York Times to put this out there because people have such racism embedded in them that they're not going to question stuff like this. But I'm sorry, we are. It's just so ridiculous. It's and so here's how we know that Sapir is a fraud. She saw three other women raped and terrorists carrying the severed heads of three more women. Okay, the names of the dead are known. Their identities are known. It's all official now. There, you could see them all at Haaretz, and they've been uh, examined by forensic pathologists. And there hasn't been any documentation of one single woman who was decapitated with a knife. There were no decapitations recorded. So this is how you know that she's a fraud and that Jeffrey Gettleman is a fraud because Jeffrey Gettleman should have been able to cross-check the forensic evidence that was available based on the recorded deaths and know what we know and what everyone else knows. They're just so sloppy at the New York Times and they're so racist that they just want to believe this. Uh, but this is th that's the end of Sapir, the key police witness. You're done. Uh, Yura Karal, the 22-year-old security consultant, was Sapir's friend who hid in the same spot and they were part of a group of friends who met up at the party um, and he, he said he barely lifted his head to look at the road, but he also described seeing a woman raped and killed, even though he barely lifted his head. By the way, what does security consultant mean? Was he a security consultant for like the, like to guard like a, a rave or is he like, is security consultant mean he's like an Israeli government, uh, security state contractor? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd well, be curious, I'd be curious to know. Yeah. Well, here's, a. Here's Roz Cohen, who is another key eyewitness who is a security contractor, identified as a security contractor. He's actually a mercenary who is in a special forces unit in the Israeli military uh, who trains the 
notorious, the the the, the uh, renowned human rights uh, friendly soldiers of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, he was hiding in a stream bed, and he describes you know graphic a graphic scene of seeing a young naked woman um, being raped by men standing in a half circle and just seeing them penetrate her. And I remember her voice screams without words. Then one raises a knife and he's and slaughtered her. Okay. Um, very, very detailed, specific testimony from this Israeli army veteran, um, Raz Cohen. And we recognized Roz Cohen because he had been um, de delivered some of the first testimony. I think Roz Cohen delivered the first claims of Hamas rape at a time when Israeli media had not yet reported it. He d delivered that to U.S. media. But Roz Cohen's first interview was on October 9th. He had gone to the Nova Electronic Music Festival, and uh, and, and we're gonna we're gonna hear his testimony. And this is very revealing. Not even a minute passed and gunfire began on the road. We ran from under the stage and took cover there. After some time, someone yelled, the terrorists were coming. We sprinted away from there where they were shooting at us. I saw people simply falling. Someone got shot in the leg and fell on the ground. I felt like we were on the shooting range. This is all like fairly like legitimate we got into the creek in the creek we saw some bushes and hid there and like this is video that he took so they were taking video there were so many terrorists around us and luckily they didn't see us from that bush we saw so many people being slaughtered with knives and the screams We were there for six or seven hours waiting for a rescue. The Israeli army found us, blah, blah, blah. Okay. He didn't say anything about seeing anyone raped. And he gave an interview also to I-24, the Israeli foreign ministry sponsored network, that same day where he also delivered the same testimony and said absolutely nothing about rape. Then... And let me just say... Okay, next. That's the, yeah. that's the basic, see, if the New York Times did its job, what it would do is it would take whatever he told them and then cross-check them as you've just done with, it, with his other public statements. Yeah. And they would have been forced to actually, to conclude that this guy is lying. Um, or at least that his statements are contradicted by what else he said publicly. But that's yeah. the minimal journalistic step among many that the New York Times did not do that you just demonstrated right there. Yes. And so... And that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to express skepticism about your sources, especially when they are connected to a state that is engaged in an international propaganda campaign to justify its genocidal rampage on Gaza through atrocity exhibition. Uh, here is Roz Cohen as his testimony develops. The following day, he's interviewed by U.S. media, PBS, and he says, we go to hide in a bush, a big bush in a creek, and we was in the bush something like six or seven hours. A lot of terrorists go around us and search for people to kill. The terrorists, people from Gaza, raped girls. And after they raped them, they killed them, murdered them with knives, or the opposite, killed, and after they raped, they, they did that. They laughed. They always laughed. I can't forget how they laughed. Okay, this is again at a time when no Israeli media had reported any rape taking place on October 7th. No one exa who examined the bodies had said anything. So what's going on here? He actually accuses, first of all, he said it could be not Hamas. I mean, he keeps talking about knives. The Hamas militants were using Kalashnikovs, maybe RPGs, maybe grenades. They didn't need knives to kill people. So he, what is he talking about? Like riffraff that came in from, from Gaza? There were, there were riffraff that came in um, who killed people. I, I believe that to be true. They burst through the fence and some people just came in and were like onlookers. Um, but we don't know who he's talking about. But the, he actually accuses them of necrophilia. He doesn't say he saw anything. It's sort of a vague recollection. And it differs from the testimony he gave to the New York Times. 
And then following that testimony, Roz Cohen from October 11th to the New York Times interview, he totally disappeared. He didn't give another testimony. So what mm -hmm. clearly happened was that when Israel decided that they needed to go with this Hamas mass rape thing to justify the assault on Gaza as international support was flagging and as the uh, base of Joe Biden, which includes many feminists and progressives, was turning on them, they searched out Roz Cohen again and he was coached and they gave him, they told him to give a more specific graphic testimony to the New York Times. And he did that and he just updated testimony, which for some reason during the real period of trauma, he didn't provide to any Israeli media at all. So this guy's a fraud. It's just pretty obvious. And Jeffrey Gettleman, again, major journalistic malpractice, not checking the clear, the, all you have to do is, you know, you can look, look for this, I'll Google it in English and Hebrew, and you'll find uh, that uh, Roz Cohen had spoken before and delivered very dramatically different testimonies over time. Um, and so when you have alleged witnesses giving conflicting and transparently ridiculous te uh, testimony, then you have to then uh, be skeptical of every claim that you're being you're being given by the Israeli government, which is the conduit for all these claims. Um, and the New York Times has none of that. And unfortunately, so many people who uh, you know have a record of challenging outlets like the New York Times and raising questions because this allegation is so sensitive. Uh, it's not easy to raise questions about sexual assault allegations. It's just it's just not. It's it's really uncomfortable. It's awkward discussing it, but because of all that, people are just accepting this New York Times story like it, it's being spoon fed to them without raising the basic questions that you've just raised here and demonstrated with the available evidence that this one key witness is a fraud, is a complete fraud. And if the key witness is a fraud, then that raises questions about every other piece of so-called reporting that the New York Times is doing here. And um, you, you combine that with the ridiculous stories that play into the stereotypes of Muslim men that racists have um, with the lack of forensic evidence. And you have all these convenient excuses for that. You have to then fundamentally question the premise of this story. And we're not going to shy away from doing that. There are people who are trying to intimidate us into being quiet about it, but we're not going to do that. It's not what we do at the gray zone. We actually are not afraid to challenge narratives, no matter how sensitive they are. Um, and no matter how, much unanimity there is in the establishment behind them, especially when they're being used to justify atrocities, as is the case here. And that's exactly what the point of the story is, is to say that these Hamas savages, they're so brutal, they're so sadistic, there's no there's no way we can talk to them, we just have to wipe them out. It totally plays in to the Israeli narrative that they need to wage this genocidal campaign in Gaza. That's, that's why we're here. That's why we fight at the gray zone is to specifically do that whenever, when so many others are too bought in, too sold out, or too cowardly to do it. Let me do one more. Just one more. We'll, um, yeah, so we have Zaka. We talked about them on previous streams. Zaka is key here when they refer to rescue teams. Yep. Uh, they're raising tons of money off of these lies and competing with another ultra orthodox rescue, so called rescue organization, which has no, they have no coronary credentials. They're not qualified to examine dead bodies. Uh, they're competing with them for fundraising. Who can spin out the most extreme allegation? Check my pinned tweet on my Twitter profile for a really excellent explainer of uh, my research on Zaka and others research. Um, Brad Pierce wrote a great piece on Substack, um, but this piece is by Propaganda and Company. And you know, in 10 minutes, you'll see why they're frauds. The New York Times didn't care because they wanted this. They wanted this story. They believe in storytelling over journalism. So um, here's one other figure that's interviewed. Uh, well, here, here we go. Is Yossi Landau in the house. The um, original fraudster, the original fabulist, 
who cooked up the uh, confirmed the non-existent beheaded babies <laughs> confer uh, co uh, cooked up the no pun intended uh I mean, I guess, no, United Hatzala cooked up the baby baked in the oven fake story. He said that, you know, fetuses were ripped out of mothers. Um, he said that he, 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 he's responsible for Joe Biden. Uh, sorry, Tony Blinken's lie before the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee that an entire family was tied up and, and burned to death. Uh, and then Hamas militants ate lunch in their kitchen. I mean, this guy, how how is it? possible to believe him and feature him in a photo at the heart of your piece after everything he's done is lied. And he said that those who question him, he, he said those who question him should be killed like Hamas militants. And this is another key source for the New York Times. Okay. We're getting to the last um, so-called eyewitness I want. Uh, let's see if I can find it in here. Just amazing. They're citing they're citing a witness who's a documented fraudster, that guy from Zaka, peddled all these lies. Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, had a long. I mean, if yeah. you're one of these chauvinists who only trusts Israeli sources and Western sources, even Haaretz admitted that all the, the so many claims put up by Zaka were frauds, were lies. The Times can't bring itself to even mention that and treat this person as if he's credible. It's such malpractice in journalism. Uh, I don't know. And it's not as if they don't know this. They're not they're not stupid. They know exactly who they're dealing with, but they're just w willfully laundering propaganda and relying on fraudsters to do so. And they know exactly what they're doing. And we can prove it. Um, and, and you know, a lot of people in Israeli media know they're doing it. Uh, this is and it's exactly what they did on Syria with the white helmets and so many other just documented liars is this they want these journalists wanted to achieve the same political objective that the state department or the British foreign office and MI6 wanted. So th they're just willing, eager stenographers. Here's an, a, a paramedic in Israel in an Israeli commando unit who said that he had found the bodies of two teenage girls in a room in Kibbutz Berry. Okay. It's known who this paramedic is, although he hides his identity and he is at least given an identification to other media, but for some reason, the New York Times papers it over. Hmm. It's He goes by G, Sergeant G or Major G. And uh, Mondo Weiss has already taken him down. Uh, Mondo Weiss has already taken this down, and I highlighted it on, tw on Twitter, their takedown. He was also interviewed by the for the Jake Tapper propaganda special on Hamas mass rape for CNN, and he said the exact same thing as he said here. Um, so what does he say? He says that he found two teenage girls in a room. One was sprawl one had her boxer shorts ripped and had bruises on her groin, and the other was sprawled on the floor face down. And he said that semen was smeared on her back. He found that, but they made no effort to do any forensic examination, even though this Major G is from, uh, or, or Sergeant G is from the Israeli Air Force Special Tactics Rescue Unit 669, which is an elite unit, which should have been able to call in forensic specialists. Okay. The problem is at Kibbutz Berry, and, and this has been confirmed by the families and by forensic pathologists and everyone who was there, there were no two girls who match the description that G gives who were found in the same posture as these girls that G claims to have found. The closest match was Yahel and Noya Sharabi. So the Sharabi sisters, and it's incredibly tragic and horrible, um, but they were found in an embrace according to the times of Israel with their mother, when they were dead, they were not in any condition like that, where they were supposedly killed with bullets, according to G and they um, showed signs of rape. In fact, it was impossible to even really determine who they were. And the Israeli forensic teams had to use DNA and their teeth to identify them because they were so badly burned. What does that mean, Aaron?
What does that suggest? And found in an embrace. Yeah, and um, I mean, I don't want to. I don't know what happened with these particularly two people, but but you're saying that their description does not match the the known list of victims. Well, the, according to the Sharabi family and to those who found them. They were not found naked with semen on them or in any position like they were sexually assaulted. They were found with their mother in an embrace and they were badly burned. Right. So their bodies couldn't even be seen, which suggests oh, that their how right. that which suggests their home was either hit by a tank shell or somehow burned by Hamas militants. Yeah. But we, we know we, that their yeah. neighbors in the the Pesa Cohen house were struck directly by an Israeli tank shell and the um, Hetzroni twins, two other teenagers, were killed by the Israeli tank shell. So, and we know is... that the New York Times, we know that, that the New York Times recently acknowledged for the first time, uh, long after the Gray Zone did and the Electronic Intifada did, that homes were hit with Israeli tank shells. And the way the Times described it was, they said it was some light shelling. Yeah, just a some light, light they, shelling. Yeah, light shells. We're gonna send in some Nerf shells. No, they killed everybody they killed dozens of people in a house yeah and it was uh the commander that that day was barack hiram who's one of the major commanders in the gaza strip who's become sort of a hero of israel he called in that strike and he lied about it as electronic intifada reported he lied mm -hmm. the new york times didn't call out his lie they just identified him there um so this is amazing We've did, we've debunked another key witness like just in a few minutes, and you know it could have been done even more easily if the New York Times had looked into just the history that was already known of G. He is a documented fraudster that they were relying on, and here is one of his greatest frauds. And it's just so obvious when you look at just the just the vibe of this video. Just look at the vibe of it, okay. This is Major G giving an interview to India's right wing Republic TV. And this is him turned around in a khaki shirt. We really don't yet, we can't actually even prove he was in Kibbutz Barry or that he even is a paramedic. He could just be anybody. Listen to what he says here. One of my teammates, he realized that uh, he saw a dog that was barking near a trash can. And we stopped by there and he opened that trash can and he pulled out of the garbage a baby, um, perhaps maybe not even a more than a year old baby that was multiple times stabbed all over his body and tossed into the garbage. One of my <laughs> I mean, I don't want to laugh at that, but it never happened. And his voice makes me laugh because he and we know that because he sounds like a nebbishy guy from Brooklyn who's just making stuff up. Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, they found the baby. Because, and you know, again, it's, it's, you can't help but laugh because these things are so ridiculous and it's so sick. And so to cope with just the sickness of these people, you have to laugh at them because they deserve it. They deserve to be mocked. So we know yes. the list of victims from October 7th. Max, I mean, you studied this very closely. Were there any uh, babies on that list that were stabbed multiple times and found in a garbage? No. And you know this too. There was only one baby recorded among the dead on October 7th. Myla Cohen, 11 months old, was accidentally shot, uh, which is still horrible. And that's it. No one uh, any anywhere near the one-year-old age range was killed on October 7th. So he just completely made that up. In October, he lied. And the New York Times didn't think to question this character who's already been discredited and proven to be a fabulous, just like Yossi Landau. How does this not just totally destroy Jeffrey Gettleman's credibility? How does he not get fired? Why is he not on the beach with a metal detector looking for loose change? Because the whole media is responsible for this genocide. The whole corporate media lied and lied. They wanted to believe everything Israel said, and they laid the groundwork to consolidate political support in Washington and London and Berlin for Israel 
to massacre thousands and thousands of Palestinian women and blow babies' heads off and burn babies alive in the Gaza Strip. And they are responsible. Jeffrey Gettleman, the New York Times, and CNN are an enemy of the people of the world. And in addition to being guilty of journalistic malpractice, and I mean, we got another. If we had another hour, we could debunk the even more in this story. And I'll be doing that in the days ahead. Again, yeah, yeah. just just again, look at this. This is the New York Times, a New York Times key witness. Look at this character. This is a sham. Okay. You were saying. And, and, and what is the aim of it all? Again, we have to stress this. The aim is to justify the actual barbarism that's going on, the ongoing genocide, the ongoing mass murder of so many Palestinian babies, so many innocents inside Gaza. That's what all of this is in the service for, service of. Every single word that New York Times puts into that piece, it's not about obtaining justice for anybody on October 7th. It's about justifying an ongoing mass murder campaign and providing the rhetorical, the emotional cover uh, for Israel to continue carrying out its atrocities against Palestinians in Gaza. That's what all of this is for. And we don't expect everyone to join us in debunking it as Max just did so masterfully. And Max, honestly, thank you for just, you put in some time to looking into these claims and you've exposed so clearly uh, that some of the key people that the New York Times relied on are frauds. Um, which then invalidates the entire thing. And we can't expect everyone to join us in doing that because, you know, most outlets just shy away from like, doing the kind of stuff that we do. But the least we can expect is to not be attacked for doing our jobs as journalists. And journalists are supposed to look at the available evidence and then apply rational scrutiny. That's exactly what Max just did. And he shows that this is a fraud, yet another fraud in the service of Israel's genocide campaign by the New York yeah. Times. Yeah, and why not just go with, the reality of what we already know, which was civilians were killed. Yeah. Jewish Israeli civilians were killed on October 7th. Yeah. Uh, that should be bad enough for them, but it's not. They need to go yeah. big because they're going to go big. They're doing big genocide. Big Israel's doing big genocide. Mm -hmm.